astronomers search for these, uh, but we gradually concluded that there simply aren't enough atoms in the universe uh, to account for all of the dark matter that we infer in galaxies and clusters. There's too much dark matter out there compared to the amount of atoms that we have added up in the universe that we've now measured very precisely. So dark matter must be made of something other than atoms or more fundamentally quarks, the things we study here in Fermi. And perhaps uh, it's made of some new kind of elementary particle that we've never seen before that isn't, you know, doesn't, uh, the atoms aren't composed. And so our name for this uh, is Weakly Interacting Massive Particle, or WIMP. Uh, and so WIMP is basically some new kind of elementary particle. It might be, say, 10 to 100 times the mass of a proton, which is so weakly interacting that we don't see it. It doesn't shine. It doesn't uh, interact with light. Uh, but it could interact via the weak interaction with ordinary kinds of uh, ordinary atoms. And so there are experiments around the world, inside uh, a deep underground, uh, filled with atoms, as you've seen here. Um, and they're looking for these wind particles coming from the dark halo of our galaxy. Uh, and the notion is that occasionally one of these winds would come in, knock into the nucleus uh, in an atom in this detector, uh, and impart some energy into that nucleus very tiny amount, uh, but if you have a sensitive enough detector, you can detect that, that energy that's possible. Uh, and so there are a number of experiments now going around the world. Fermi Lab is an active program uh, in searching for these dark matter movements using these techniques. There's a variety of different techniques. They all involve people uh, wearing <laughs> uh, and, uh this is uh, an interesting field. There have been some of these experiments have claimed to have seen dark matter particles. Uh, others that we think are more sensitive have not yet seen. So it's an interesting time. Uh, and these experiments are getting more and more sensitive. Uh, and there's a hope that in the next decade, perhaps, uh, we may actually detect uh, in, in, a, in a verifiable way these, these dark matter particles. Another possibility is that we may actually produce these dark matter. Yeah. Uh, we've all heard of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, our sister laboratory in Switzerland, where the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012. They're bashing protons together at very unprecedentedly high energy. Uh, and the hope is that perhaps uh, in one of these collisions, the protons, they may produce uh, dark matter particles with, uh, that we can infer through their signature. A third possibility for detecting dark matter is that we may see uh, wind annihilating with each other. So our current theory suggests that if there are dark matter wind particles, there would also be antiparticles floating around in the halo of our galaxy. Uh, and whenever a, a wind particle and antiparticle come close together and collide, they would annihilate, giving off a burst of energy which would lead to radiation, high-energy radiation, again, that we can see in the other And so, and Fermi has a Yeah.
game was University of Chicago 18, Indiana 12. I think it took them a while before they, you know, Steph Curry hadn't been invented yet. Uh, they didn't have three-pointers back then, so nevertheless, uh, Hubble uh, really had, uh, went on to a brilliant career in astronomy, uh, and uh, to celebrate his career, um, astronomer John Brunsfeld, also a Chicago graduate, uh, brought his basketball up to uh, on one of the missions where they uh, refurbished the Hubble Space. Okay, so here's the expanding universe. As, as time goes on, everything in the universe is moving away from everything else. If you were to run this movie backward in time, eventually everything would be on top of everything else. 13.8 billion years ago, that's what we call the Big Bang. And I wanted to stress a few, a few key points about the expanding universe. One is we're really talking about exp uh, the distance between galaxies increasing. Uh, we don't think our galaxy is expanding. Uh, we don't think this room is expanding. I'm expanding, but that's because I eat too much. Uh, generally, uh, you know, within our galaxy, gravity is keeping things sort of stable. Uh, so it's really the distance between galaxies which is increasing in time. And again, to give you a sense of scale, a galaxy 100 million light years away is moving away from us at 2,000 miles per second. So the universe is kind of humming along. Um, and um, uh, again, this was really established uh, by Hubble in the late, the late 90s. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions about the expanding universe, uh, and often many of these misconceptions are traced to the fact that this picture, while useful, we have to be cautious in interpreting it, uh, because we're looking at a lower dimensional universe from our three-dimensional perspective. So we don't think the universe has a center or an edge, at least not that we can see. It looks the same everywhere. It's homogeneous and isotropic. And the expansion is happening everywhere. There's no, it's not exploding into empty space. And so really that picture of an expanding balloon is somewhat misleading. It's probably better to think of, say, an infinite raisin bread. Think of the raisins as galaxies. You put enough yeast into it and put it into the oven, and it will start to expand. Each raisin will move away from all of the other raisins. That's probably a better analogy for the expanding universe. Um, another point to make is that as, as the universe expands, like any gas, uh, it gets less dense and it cools off. Therefore, if we run the movie backward in time toward the Big Bang, uh, it becomes hotter and denser. So today the universe is very cold, it's only three degrees above absolute zero, and very diffuse, the, the density of the universe is very low. Um, but in the early universe it was much hotter and much denser. And so this is now uh, our best picture of the early universe, cosmic microwave background radiation. This is a scene from the Planck satellite. So this is an all-sky image of the temperature of the universe uh, as it appears today. Um, three degrees above absolute zero. So the red and blue splotches are regions where the temperature is slightly hotter and slightly colder than the average. And that slight is only one part in 100,000. So the universe, to first approximation, has the same temperature everywhere, but it has these slight differences in temperature from one place to the other. 
Now this is really giving us a snapshot of what the universe looked like when it was only 380,000 years old. It's now 13.8 billion. So this is really a picture of the, of the adolescent universe. And at that time, it had a temperature of a few thousand degrees. But since then, with the expansion of the universe, it has cooled to a temperature just below three degrees above zero. So this is a picture of what the universe looks like today. This is a map of galaxies uh, from an infrared survey done a number of years ago. Each of the little white uh, squares there is the location of, of a galaxy. So there's uh, a few million galaxies in this picture. Uh, the blue is just, uh, this is in funny coordinates, so the blue is actually infrared emission from our own galaxy. Um, and again, what you show, what you see here, is that the universe today is actually quite lumpy. Uh, it's not obvious that the, what the contrast is here, but the lumpiness of the universe today is, is orders of magnitude larger than it was you know, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And so our picture is that as the universe has evolved, it started from nearly homogeneous conditions. The density of the universe was almost the same everywhere in space. Uh, but then, over time, gravity acted on slight differences in the density between different locations in space, regions that were denser than average, uh, accrued matter onto them, regions that were less dense than average uh, became more and more vacuous. And eventually, uh, large-scale structures formed. This kind of web, this thing we call the cosmic web. So this is a computer simulation of the evolution of structure from nearly homogeneous initial conditions to a very uh, inhomogeneous universe that we see today. And in this simulation, the only ingredients are gravity acting on particles and dark matter particles, for example, winds. Uh, they didn't even bother to put in atoms in this, uh, in this simulation because they're a small minority compared to the dark matter. And this simulated universe looks remarkably like that lumpy universe of galaxies that we actually see today. So our picture of the history of the universe is that it started in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, started expanding very rapidly. There's a period we call cosmic inflation. Uh, once it had, had reached about 308,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, that's when the, the photon, the radiation in the microwave background, uh, uh, started streaming away from the atoms. And that gives us this picture of the the microwave background that we saw in Plunk. And then over the succeeding billions of years, the small, the small fluctuations in the temperature and density of the universe evolved by gravity into the large-scale structures we see today, galaxies, stars, planets, and larger-scale structures. So that's the picture we have now of how the universe has evolved. So we, have, we know the universe is expanding, and it's natural to ask, is the expansion changing over time? What do, so what do we expect? Well, again, gravity is the dominant force on large scale. Uh, and so we can do a simple thought experiment. We're sitting here on the Milky Way. We look at all these other galaxies, these billions of galaxies. They're all receding away from us due to the expansion of the universe. But our galaxy is tugging on each of those galaxies because of gravity. Uh, we're exerting a gravitational force on all those billions of galaxies moving away from us. And therefore, we would expect that if we observe any one of those galaxies next year, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, the speed with which it's moving away from us should reduce over time, should, get, should be slowing down, because we're pulling it. And so that was the expectation through much of the 20th century, that the expansion should be gradually slowing down over time. Uh, and Hubble and his, uh, many of the people he uh, taught and worked with and who followed him tried to measure that slowing down of the cosmic expansion uh, and never could, could do it because it was, uh, the measurements are, are very challenging to make. And then in the late 1990, two teams of astronomers studying distant supernovae in fact found that the expansion was not slowing down. They both found evidence that it was in fact speeding up over time. Uh, and this was uh, led to the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2011 uh, for the leaders of those two teams. So I want to talk a little bit about this discovery and some of its implications.
So this is a supernova. This is the kind of uh, event those astronomers were looking at. So this is a nearby galaxy. In the lower left, you see what looks like a bright star. That's, in fact, a star in that galaxy, which exploded. And about three weeks after it exploded, it became nearly as bright as all the other billions of stars in that galaxy. So supernovae are, are remarkable events. They, uh, they go from being uh, fainter than the sun to being brighter than a billion suns over the course of just a few weeks. And then they fade over the course of a few months. Uh, and this is a, uh, a gallery of about 500 supernovae that we discovered uh, in the mid-2000s using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, and again, what you do is you look at, you take a big survey of the sky, you come back some time later, you look at the same patches of the sky, and you see if there's anything new. That, that each of these blue splotches is a new star, a supernova, that wasn't there when we took the images of those galaxies a few weeks before this. We think, so the, the, these, these supernova that we're looking at are a particular kind of supernova called the type 1a supernova. And we have good evidence that type 1a supernovae are explosions of what we call white dwarf stars. These are very compact stars. Our sun will eventually, we think, become a white dwarf star once it's finished burning all of its nuclear fuel. And it will become very compact and dense. Uh, and if you have a white dwarf star near another star, and either accreting material from it because of gravity, or else orbiting another white dwarf star and eventually colliding with it, in both of those cases, the white dwarf, the mass of the white dwarf will increase until it reaches the maximum mass, called the Chandrasekhar mass, uh, about 1.4 times the mass of the sun, and then it will explode. It will undergo a thermonuclear explosion. Uh, and it's those explosions and the radiation from those explosions that lead to these supernovae events. And so these two teams of astronomers in the late 1990s, what they could do, what they realized was that these supernova, these type 1a supernova explosions, all had about the same brightness when they, about three weeks after they exploded, they reached their peak brightness and then faded. And they, they, had, they had determined that all of these, these supernovae had the same intrinsic luminosity. So they were all like 100 watt light bulbs, obviously much brighter, but all 100 watts, not 80 or 120. And so this means that these, these particular kinds of supernovae are what we call standard candles. And if you know how bright something is, uh, then you can determine how far away it is relative to other supernovae. And so what they were able to plot was essentially um, they, they, we could tell uh, how big the universe was when they were uh, exploded. That's the redshift. We can tell that from the spectrum of light. And then they used the brightness of the supernovae to essentially tell how far away they were, or alternatively, how far in the past they had exploded. Uh, and what we had expected was something like this black line, that a supernova that went off when the universe was two-thirds its present size would have a particular brightness. But the points there are showing you that instead, uh, a supernova that went off when the universe had a certain, a certain fraction of its current size was actually about 25% fainter than we expected. And that was the indication that the expansion of the universe is not is not slowing down due to gravity, but is in fact speeding up. Uh, and that's what led to the Nobel Prize. So why is this a strange phenomenon? Why is this a mystery? Uh, well, you know, whenever you have any kind of object, uh, every time you've taken any object and you've thrown it up and dropped it, um, as soon as, when you, whenever you throw up a ball, as soon as it leaves your hand, it's moving upward, but what's happening? It's slowing down due to gravity. It's attracted to the center of the Earth. As soon as it leaves my hand, it starts to slow down, and because I can't throw very hard, eventually it reaches some maximum height, and then falls back down to Earth. And every time you've thrown a ball up, that's what happens. Uh, and that's because gravity is attracted. Um, so, but what the universe is doing, it's sort of like, imagine I throw this ball up, 
and initially it starts slowing down due to gravity, but then at some point, instead of continuing to slow down and eventually hitting a maximum point and falling back to Earth, instead it starts to speed up and rockets out of the atmosphere of the Earth into uh, you know, outer space. That's what the universe is doing. Safe to say we've never seen that in our everyday experience. Uh, but that's why the acceleration of the expansion, the speed up of cosmic expansion, uh, is a mystery because it, it confounds our understanding of gravity. So what could be causing the speed up of the expansion? And we basically think there are two possibilities. The first possibility is that the universe is filled with some kind of stuff that gives rise to a kind of repulsive gravity. Gravity is usually attractive in our everyday experience, uh, in the solar system, in our galaxy, but perhaps when we're talking about things on cosmic scales, there is some additional stuff in the universe, it's not dark matter, it's not atoms, it must be something else, which has the property that it makes things repel from the and therefore speed away from each other. We now call this dark energy. Uh, and we think that the universe is 70% dark energy. That's one possibility. The other is that maybe something strange is going on with gravity when we get to cosmic scale. Again, in the Earth, the solar system, our galaxy, uh, gravity obeys Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's attractive, of course. But again, perhaps when we get to very large scales, uh, gravity uh, behaves in a different way in such a way that things can accelerate away from each other. So that's the second logical possibility, is that there's something going wrong with our understanding of gravity. So we now have this picture that's been put together just over the last 10, 15 years, that 95% of the universe is dark, doesn't emit with a light or interact with light. So the stuff we see in our everyday world uh, stuff made of atoms, or more fundamentally quarks, that's only 5% of the universe. So the stuff we're trying to figure out the nature of, primarily here at Fermilab and elsewhere, that's only 5% of the universe. Uh, the stuff that we know about, that, that the, the, the laws of physics that we know. We think 25% is this dark matter, it's not made of atoms, it's made of, perhaps of some new element. And that's the stuff that's holding galaxies and clusters of galaxies together. And is the engine by which galaxies, with gravity, by which structure forms in the universe. And then we think the dominant component of the universe, 70%, is this dark energy, this gravitational force of stuff that's actually speeding up the expansion of the universe. Uh, dark energy is not, it's not something we observe in our everyday life. It has no tangible effects, again, on terrestrial, uh, terrestrial scale that wants to dilute to weak force. So it would only come into play. So one interesting thing is, um, I said that the universe today, we think, is about 70% dark energy. That's, uh, if you look on the right-hand column, uh, about 20% dark matter, about 4 or 5% atomic uh, ordinary matter. But if we go back in time, uh, then those relative amounts of those different components uh, are, will change. We think that as the universe expands, um, dark matter becomes more dilute, ordinary matter becomes more dilute, because as things, you know, the distance between them gets bigger, the density, the mass per unit volume goes down. But that doesn't happen with dark energy. Uh, so since dark energy is dominating today, uh, as the universe, uh, we think that the density of dark energy hasn't changed very much from today to earlier time. And that means if I go back in time when, this, when the universe was denser, higher density of dark matter and ordinary matter, that means dark energy was relatively less important. So if I go back to a time nine and a half billion years after the Big Bang, in the middle column there, then we think the universe was about 50% dark energy, 43% or so dark matter, 7% ordinary matter. And if I go even further back in time, 
to just a billion years after the Big Bang. And we think dark energy was only 1%. Dark matter was the dominant component, 84%. Ordinary matter, about 15%. And this is important because remember I showed you that movie of structure forming by gravity. That only works in a universe where the bulk of the stuff is dark matter. Once dark energy tr takes over, from, becomes more dominant than dark matter, structure can no longer form because dark energy is this repulsive force pushing things away from each other where gravity was the thing pulling them together. Uh, so we think that before uh, you know, a few billion years, the universe actually was slowing down due to the gravity of dark matter. Uh, and then maybe seven, eight, nine billion years after the Big Bang, uh, dark matter became sufficiently dilute that dark energy took over and caused the universe to speed up. So what is dark energy? Well, we don't know. Uh, we think it's a component with negative pressure, uh, and that's what we need in general relativity to make something which would be gravitation repulsive. But we really don't have a good fundamental understanding of what dark energy is. Our most conservative hypothesis is that it's the energy of empty space itself, the vacuum. So if I take some, this, if I took this bottle of water, poured all the water out of it, put a vacuum hose uh, on it evacuated all the air from it, shielded it from cosmic rays. Um, uh, there would be no particles left in it, no ordinary matter. I could shield it from dark matter. Uh, and it would be empty space. In classical physics, empty space would have no energy. But in quantum physics, ener empty space has energy due to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And so, and it turns out that in quantum mechanics, the vacuum the energy of the vacuum would have the right properties to be dark energy, it would have this gravitationally repulsive effect. Uh, so that's the most uh, conservative hypothesis. Uh, now the only slight problem with that uh, hypothesis is that if I calculate how much energy uh, there is in the vacuum in this little bottle of water, it's infinity. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's not an infinite amount of energy inside this bottle. So that means that our calculations are wrong. And this has, in fact, been a major embarrassment for theoretical physics for the last century. Uh, we just don't have an understanding of why the vacuum, the energy of, the, of empty space, is not infin infinity or much larger than we observe it. So it's still a fundamental mystery. There are other suggestions for what the dark energy could be. Uh, one popular idea is that perhaps the energy of the dark energy is associated with a much, much lighter cousin of the Higgs boson, a different kind of field permeating the universe. Uh, but those ideas are even uh, much more speculative. Uh, and so I thought what I would do would be, uh, you know, when you don't have the answer to something, you ask Siri. Um, so Siri, what do you think the nature of dark energy is? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't answer that. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was worth a shot. <coughs> okay. Okay. All right, so we don't know what dark energy is. Siri doesn't even know what dark energy is. Nevertheless, dark energy is important. Why is it important? Well, the nature of dark energy is going to determine the future evolution of the universe. It's already 70% of the universe. I said it was less, a smaller fraction in the past. That means in the future, dark energy is going to be an increasing fraction of the universe. So it's dominating now. It's going to dominate, we think, into the future. And so we need to understand its properties if we were to have any hope of determining what the future evolution of the universe is going to be. Uh, and one way to do that, to understand the nature of dark energy, is to make maps of the universe. They can give us clues to what dark energy is. Uh, and so that leads me into the project uh, I've been working on with colleagues here and around the world for a number of years called the Dark Energy Survey. And our basic goal is to make a map of the universe, to try to understand the history of the expansion of the universe and the history of this growth of the clumpiness of the universe 
in order to get at the properties of dark energy or whatever is causing the universe to heat up. And so what we've done is we've built a camera for a telescope in Chile, and we're now conducting two surveys of the universe, taking pictures, snapshots, of eventually 300 million galaxies over about one-eighth of the sky. And we're also taking snapshots of certain smaller regions of the sky, which we go back to and point in the same direction roughly every week to, to discover these, more of these supernovae. The Nobel Prize work was based on um, uh, observations of just a few tens of supernovae. In this project, we're going to have observations of thousands of supernovae and hundreds of millions of galaxies. So we started, uh, the survey started in late August of 2013. It's been, we just finished our third observing season. Uh, it's supported in the United States by the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. So this is your tax dollars at work, uh, and we are trying to spend them wisely. We also have foreign and institutional partners who have contributed to the project. And uh, we're using this, this map to try to understand the history of cosmic expansion and the growth of the structure using four primary techniques. I don't have time to go into them in detail, but I'll just list them. One is to study these clusters of galaxies and to actually take a list of clusters, count how many of them there are in a given volume of space. A second is this technique of gravitational lensing that I mentioned before, look at the distortions of the shapes of distant galaxies as their light passes through the foreground distribution of dark matter. A third technique is just to measure the distribution of galaxies in space, what we call large-scale structure. And the fourth is the technique that led to the discovery of cosmic acceleration, these supernovae, but just to measure many more of them, measure them more precisely, and measure them to greater distance. Um, so I think I'll just, uh, yeah, so I'll, just, I'll just mention one of these four techniques. This is weak gravitational lensing. So again, the idea here is we're measuring the shapes of very distant galaxies. The light from those galaxies is traveling towards us through this foreground distribution of dark matter, halos of dark matter associated with galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Uh, and as it travels through them, the light paths get bent. That's what Einstein's general relativity told us. And that slight bending leads to slight distortions of the shapes of those galaxies. Before, I showed you very pronounced distortions of the shapes of galaxies. That's what we call strong lensing. Uh, but that only happens to a minority of distant galaxies if they happen to be just near the line of sight to some foreground galaxy. All galaxies, all distant galaxies, get weakly or weakly uh, And so we can measure this uh, by using the shapes of these 200 million distant galaxies. And that will give us uh, information on dark energy. Um, so we, in order to do this project, we've built an international collaboration. Uh, we have 400 scientists from around the world. Uh, the project is led uh, by a team here at Fermilab in the U.S., but we have collaborators in England and in Europe, and Brazil, uh, and Australia. And we use uh, this telescope. This is the Blanco Telescope on Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. This is operated by the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. It's in the northern uh, Andes Mountains of northern Chile. So inside, these are three different telescopes. The biggest one is that one